Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Rotel and the model number is RA-01. Specifications, power output 40 watts per channel into 8 ohm speakers, frequency response is 10 hertz to 40 kilohertz and total harmonic distortion comes in at 0.03%. A nice feature is that you can connect directly a turntable so as long as your turntable supports a moving magnet type cartridge you can connect directly with no requirement for an external equaliser or preamplifier and your millivoltage is standard at 2.5 millivolts and then for your other inputs auxiliary 1, auxiliary 2, CD, tuner and tape that's 150 millivolts and you also have a preamp output 1 volt 470 ohms so you may if you wish connect it to additional amplifiers and then dimensions width is 435, a depth of 342 and a height of 72 millimeters and then overall weight is 5.9 kilograms. Now you also have a headphone socket which is a quarter inch jack and then individual controls for your tone circuits. Now I do like the construction of this amplifier and I am a fan of Rotel. The build quality is excellent so real minimal use of plastics throughout the amplifier, nice steel construction or metal construction and the sound quality is really really high. So what was the issue with this amplifier when it came into the workshop? Well the customer Martin Johnson contacted me via the YouTube channel and he had this amplifier and what he was sort of reporting was that on the left channel it was like intermittent drop out of audio and then after a relatively short time he contacted me and just said oh it looks like the right channel has failed and he did a little bit of investigation and then confirmed that the uh, audio output transistors appeared to be short circuit so at that point he was uh, quite happy you know to send the amplifier into me for repair so what I'm showing you next are the power supply fuses now this is what Martin found he found that these fuses are blown and these are T5 amp the time delay 5 amp fuses and these were replaced and the next thing that I'm showing you are the speaker protection relays now I sort of want to just sort of touch on what this issue is regarding where you get this intermittent loss of sound and I've described this in many of the tutorial videos a more common issue is that these relays that are being shown the contacts which are used to switch the audio through to the speaker terminals or the binding posts become oxidized and resistive and what you find is if the audio is low or maybe from time to time you turn the amplifier on and then off you get this intermittent loss of sound because the audio and the voltage and current can't overcome the resistance so you get this drop out of sound so what I always do just as a matter of course is to replace these relays and these relays are 24 volt DC coil and they are single pole double throw relays I just mean that these are common G2 case style and of course you can remove the top covers but you know this amplifier has seen reasonable service so you know I'm not looking to do that just really to swap them out will provide as I've said on many tutorials the longevity of the repair now the next thing that I'm showing you is the low voltage power supply now this is the plus or minus 18 volt supply and you've seen this on many of the tutorials so during manufacture of this time period for whatever reason they thought it was a really good idea to put some additional glue around the electrolytic capacitors thinking that in some ways it's going to provide extra mechanical support I've always scratched my head about this you know I can't imagine that uh, there would be that much sort of vibration and movement which would result in excess stress on the capacitor legs or even you know the, the capacitors would fall out but here you have it now the issue with this glue and it's been described many many times is that when they first put it in everything is fine but then as the amplifier ages and the glue starts to age what happens then is it does two things first of all it starts to become conductive the second thing is it also becomes corrosive so what we're showing here is this glue around the capacitors but it's also coating the plus and minus 18 volts supply zener diodes and literally when you sort of touch these they're all breaking off that's the level of corrosion that, that you get on there and then the next thing that i'm showing you is where I've removed one of the electrolytic capacitors. Now in this case, the electrolytic capacitor that's been removed, you can see that this glue still has some elasticity to it. So some cases you can find that it's completely dried out and it's almost like a lacquer. And again, what I've said on the previous tutorials is you have to be very, very careful. What you don't want to do is just go in there and start removing it with no form of eye protection. I really want to emphasize that because I'm telling you it will flick up and it will go into your eye and cause damage here less so 
But what I've done is I've removed all the electrolytic capacitors in that area, including the large power supply electrolytics. And the reason for that is you have links on the board. And the last thing you want is this residual conductive glue coming across some of the links because it causes all sorts of problems and failure. So what I do is, as I said, I remove each electrolytic and I will remove all of the glue. So what you now see is the board completely cleaned off. Now, often I get asked the question, you know, what do you kind of use to do this? Well, don't go in there with a metal screwdriver because you're going to scratch the board and mark the board. You don't want to be doing that. So what I use is a plastic tool, which is normally used for removing labels. And then just take your time, as I said, wear your eye protection. And then you should be able to return the board to the same condition that you see in here. And then the next thing, of course, that I have to do is I have to replace the components which have been coated by the glue. Now, I don't need to replace the electrolytics because it's only coating the plastic covering of the electrolytic capacitor. And of course, while the capacitors are out, I also checked them with the ESR meter to confirm that they were you know, within manufacturer's tolerance and were still good, which in this case they were. So here on the next photograph what we're showing you is after the work has been completed so now you don't see any of this glue and what you're seeing is the reinstallation of the electrolytic capacitors and then just really to sort of expand on this and to give you some more insight what i'm showing here is the low voltage power supply so this is the plus or minus 18 volts that i said to you earlier about and i'm also pointing here to the zener diodes and they are 18 volt 500 milliwatts zeners and then what you see here is what we call a series regulated power supply. So the power transistors, top and bottom, because of course plus and minus. And then what the Zener diodes are doing is they are controlling the voltage to the point that the output from the shunt power transistors is 18 volts. So of course, if these Zener diodes become corroded or they break, what you'll see is a loss of voltage. Or you may also see in some cases the failure of the power supply circuit. Now... Yes, this amplifier had a failure of one of the channels, but what I'm highlighting and what I continually keep on mentioning through these tutorials is don't just repair what has failed. There's a lot of issues which come which are age related with amplifiers. So take your time to do all of this remedial work. So just to recap, we've replaced already the speaker protection relays, eliminating this intermittent loss of sound associated with these. And then here to provide the longevity on the low voltage power supply. What have we done? Well, we've removed this conductive and corrosive glue and we've replaced any components which have been contaminated or coated by it. And then I can move on to the actual fault. So because the right channel was the failure, what I'm now showing you is the circuit. So the first thing that you can see is that we have a burnt out resistor on the circuit board. And this is on one of the power transistors. I think it was for the base. And then you, what I'm showing you next, and this is sort of interesting, you can see that there is a hole in this resistor here. So this resistor is one of the emitter resistors. And if you measured it with your multimeter, it would read open circuit as it did in this case. Now, this is the point about these types of failure. When resistors burn out, sometimes, as you saw in the earlier photograph, the resistor is physically burnt and there's some scorch mark on the circuit board. When you look at this larger power resistor, because the armic value is very low at 0.22 ohms, what has happened is, yes, you see a small hole, but sometimes you don't even see that. And if you just go and replace the power output transistors and maybe the smaller quarter watt resistor and then power up the amplifier without doing any further checks, you'll find that your output transistors will fail because there's still issues with the emitter resistors. So it's a case of replacing the two power output transistors, also checking the driver transistors, and then also the associated transistors in the earlier part of the circuit. And most importantly, you need to do these resistance checks to make sure that none of the emitter resistors are open. So the other emitter resistor was high, not open circuit, but as a matter of course, these are two watt resistors. I replaced them all even in the other channel as well, because they've been in operation for a number of years. Just in front of where you see that burn mark, you can see TP2, and we'll sort of come back to what that is a little bit later in the tutorial. So the next thing that I'm showing you is the amplifier, which is upended. A really nice point about this amplifier is that it has a bottom plate, which you can remove for service, and you really have full access to the circuit board. Well, the point that I'm emphasizing here is that this amplifier, and what you find with most of these Rotel amplifiers, 
The circuit board quality is very high, so the circuit tracks are good. And then also as well, the solder connections are very good as well. So you don't often tend to find dry joints on these types of amplifiers. As a matter of course, what I do is I just scan the board and any which looks slightly grey, I will just reflow them to ensure that, you know, there won't be any further issues after that. So the next thing that I'm highlighting here is concerning the output transistors. And this is critically important. There are available on semi or ST micro transistors, which you can purchase and then install in the amplifier. The issue is, is if you install those transistors, even though they have the same part number, they will not work you'll find that the amplifier really will go into some form of oscillation, which will then result in the destruction of the output transistors and probably the emitter resistors and other components as well. In all cases, what you need to install are Sanyo originals and they can be obtained from certain suppliers. So you can see here that the output transistors are 2SB817C and 2SD1047C. So once these are installed, I'm confident, as the engineer is taking care of the repair work, that there will be no issues associated with this oscillation which I mentioned earlier. And then the next photograph in the video, what you can see here is this is after the channel has been repaired. And you can see that the small value resistor has been replaced. You can also see that there's brand new emitter resistors in there. The two output transistors have also been replaced. The driver transistor was okay, and of course, I've also checked all the other components before that earlier part or output stage of the amplifier. And then we can sort of highlight it here. So here I've done an extract of the right channel circuit diagram. And what you can see is that there are multiple resistors which have gone open circuit. So the small value resistor, which was the quarter one, is R626. And that was a 220 ohm resistor. And then you had the emitter resistor with them, which is R630 which is 0.22 ohms, and that's 2 watts. And then once that was done, of course, I could power up the amplifier, and normally I will power it up via the dim bulb tester, and I'll put a link in the description for anyone who's maybe a new subscriber and has not listened to any of these repair tutorials before. With the dim bulb tester, the bulb didn't light brightly, so that told me that there was really nothing in there which was drawing excess current. And then the next thing, of course, what I need to do is I need to look at setting the bias millivoltage for the output channels. And you can see here from the circuit diagram that you have a preset on the board. And then coming back to that test connector, which I mentioned earlier, which is just in front of the emitter resistor, you connect your multimeter probes across there. And then you will then adjust the amplifier output stage until you read four millivolts. And that's what I'm showing here. So this channel is the left channel and you can see the multimeter just in the background and it's bang on four millivolts and then once i've adjusted it i will then move across and then again here we now see the right channel and you can see that it's now been adjusted again to four millivolts and you need to leave the amplifier probably warm enough for about 20 minutes just for stabilization you wouldn't have any speakers connected or any input audio coming into it and then, as I say, once you've got that nice stabilisation, it's really very easy just to make that adjustment. As I've said in many tutorials, you probably want to spray the presets with some deoxid contact cleaner uh, with the amplifier powered off. Just rotate them backwards and forwards a number of times and then return them back to their rough position and then do the adjustment until both channels are 4 millivolts. Now, this amplifier really have been in a very good environment. So for the tone selection switch and also the input selection switch, it was just a matter of cleaning it then with deoxid. There wasn't any reason to remove it from the circuit board and do a complete strip down. And then here what we're also showing is a top of the amplifier. And this is after completion of all of the work. So you can see the, just in the back, you can see the blue relays. So these are the speaker protection relays, the new ones installed. And then the two channels, which have then been repaired. And you saw earlier in the video where I had the low voltage power supply and all of that conductive glue had been removed. You can just about see just towards the front of this photograph, tone switches. And then here, what I'm showing you is all of the components removed. So there's the speaker protection relays. There's the two failed output power transistors and you can see the emitter resistors and then also the Zener diodes from the power supply and the small 220 ohm quarter watt resistor there. So once all of that was done, 
Really the last thing that sort of remained is just to put the amplifier through a functional test and no concerns. The headphone socket was also sort of checked and cleaned with deoxid because sometimes if it's not been in use for a period of time you can sort of get some oxidisation on the contacts. And as I said, really a joy to work on these amplifiers, it really is. And I appreciated, you know, Martin Johnson getting in contact with me. So as always, I really appreciate you stopping by and taking the time. And again, if you have any questions or you need any more information, by all means, reach out to me at audioamplifierservicing at AOL.com and I'll be more than happy to come back and provide any information that you may require. So until the next time, all the very best. Cheers and bye-bye.